Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my guest is Robert Phoenix. Robert has been a guest with us before. Robert has unique insight, a deep understanding of history, geopolitics, astrophysics, astrology, and so forth. So without any further ado, Robert, welcome back to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Uh, hey, James. Thanks for having me back on, and uh, I always enjoy being on here with you. I think you're a terrific host, and um, and I've been telling people that uh, we're going to have the show, and we'll, we'll put it out there and blast it and and uh, get you some more eyeballs and some more ear holes. So thanks for having me on. Uh, anytime, Robert. Well, based on what's been going on and your analysis, I know you just did a chart on the person who committed the uh, self-immolation. Uh, wherever you want to go with it, uh, you know, just what do you see hermetically as above, so below? Uh, a lot of unrest in the heavens, and as Elizabethans would have said uh, of English times. Also, that unrest is reflected here on terra firma. So, uh, you know, the floor is yours, Robert. Yeah. So, to, to be clear, um, I, I didn't do uh, Bushnell's chart. I somebody told me that he might be a Pisces which would make some sense. But what struck me about the self-immolation is a current transit that is taking place with Chiron, which is um, kind of a planetoid, I suppose. Um, it's a, a, a it's an object that is located between Saturn and Uranus. There are all these very large chunks um which come in from the kuiper belt which are more than likely uh pieces of uh, uh maldek or marduk whatever you want to um name the, the the planet that was supposedly involved in this interplanetary war with mars and a lot of these very large chunks have been sucked into saturn's orbit and have become moons um and in 1977 they found that uh, there were two of these um, objects. I think they discovered one first, then the other one secondarily, uh, that actually had an orbit, like it had this strange elliptical orbit. And they settled on the name of Chiron for this object. And again, the first, um, the first sort of citing of it and cataloging of it takes place in 1977. At that time, Chiron is in the sign of Taurus. So it, it really makes its presence known uh, as Gen X is starting to get cooking, right? A lot of Gen X people have Chiron and Taurus. And it has a 50-year irregular orbit. So what what in a very short period of time, what people have been able to understand is the importance of what's called the Chiron return, which happens at the age of 50. And it's when Chiron returns to where it was in your birth chart. Now, what's interesting is that none of these discussions were happening prior to 1977. So even afterwards, as the astrological community began to integrate Chiron and its importance it really brings us a new wrinkle in terms of um, what it represents and how we can look at larger cycles um, with what's going on in the world in general. And if you go back and look at like what was happening in 1968, um, and this is way before, uh, the discovery of Chiron in 1968. Well, not too much. 1968 Chiron was in Aries. And when you, when you look at that time, you can see that it's sort of the beginning of second wave feminism and Aries represents the male energy or masculine energy. And so we see this movement of women wanting, because what's the opposite sign of, of Aries? It's Libra which is Venus ruled. It's all about balance and it's all about rights and it's all about um, equality. So you can see the other sort of manifesting itself. And then 
in my estimation, that's a period where men start to become weaker and women start to become stronger, you know, and it's not long after that, that we get Helen ready. I am woman. Right. And, um, and then also Chiron and Aries is very much an incredibly violent time in, in what's going on in the world, particularly in places like France in the summer of 1968, um, you have the Democratic Convention in Chicago. And, and you know, some would say that, you know, this was the uh, kind of the the militarization of the common man, right? Viva la Re- revolution. Um, and that there, there was a, a huge amount of risk involved in kind of one's standing or one's life in order to rise up against the man or the machine. And with Chiron, there's always some degree of risk that you're either going to be seen as an outsider, uh, rejected. Um, That's part of Chiron's story. So to understand Chiron, we have to go back to the original source. And Chiron is the offspring of Kronos and Philyra. And Philyra was a what's called an oceanid. So she was a nymph of the ocean. And Kronos, there are two stories of Chiron and Chiron's um, conception. One, Kronos comes to Earth as a white stallion, um, and apparently Philyra could not resist a white stallion, and then copulates with her. Uh, the other story is that uh, he um, turns uh, Philyra also into a horse, to avoid being seen by by Hera, so um, they're both horses. I, I guess that's the, the the you know the the G-rated version of it. Um, but in any case, Philyra has an offspring, and when she has this offspring, it's a centaur. And all those asteroids that I was talking about between Uranus and Saturn, they're all named after centaurs, including Chiron. And the other asteroid that has a discernible orbit is called Charlico, and that's the name of Chiron's wife. But we focus mainly on Chiron. So what happens to Chiron after he's born? His mother rejects him because he's hideous, right? He's this demigod that is half horse. So part of what we get with Chiron is rejection. That's one of the key themes. Another part of of that, which goes along with rejection, is shame. And then the third part of Chiron um, that is a a kind of a a manifestation of those two is guilt. So rejection, shame, and guilt is what Chiron kind of specializes in, right? Now, Philyra uh, is so horrified, she beseeches to the gods to turn her into an inanimate object so that she could never um, have another child and the gods of course, um, listen to her and they turn her into a a tree. I'm not sure if it's an alder or a birch, but she, she becomes a tree, right? And now Chiron is abandoned. And that's another aspect of Chiron is abandonment. So we have rejection, we have shame, we have abandonment and guilt. All four of those qualities are associated with Chiron to some degree. Now, what happens to Chiron is that he's adopted and he is adopted by Apollo and um, Artemis, and they teach uh, Chiron everything. And this is all happening in a place called Mount Pelion, and that becomes Chiron's home. Mount Pelion becomes his home. So he learns about everything, um, astrology, astronomy, um, music, poetry, uh, the healing arts. Uh, even Warcraft, the, the, he becomes sort of this r- Renaissance figure, and he plays a very significant role because uh, the 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 characters of the Iliad and the Odyssey are all trained by Chiron. He's their teacher, so he plays a huge role in establishing them to go on on their quests, and he also plays a role with Achilles and. 
Um, we get the whole Achilles heel story and Chiron is a part of that as well. And so Chiron is this really interesting character. And at the end of his life, um, he sees Prometheus having his liver pecked out every day and he can't stand it. So he offers himself up uh, to be a stand in for Prometheus and uh, the gods tell him, well, if you do this, you will lose your immortality. And Chiron says, well, that's okay. I, you know, I will die for his suffering. Right. So it's kind of a weird inversion of the, of the Christ theme because Christ dies or Jesus dies and attains immortality, right? His soul um, is resurrected and is immortal. Whereas Chiron is immortal and uh, he sacrifices himself to become a man, theoretically. So it's just really, there's a sacrificial component to Chiron, but the, the outcomes are quite different. And Prometheus, of, you know, of course, is in some ways is the embodiment of the hubris of man, right? Like he's going to steal fire from the gods. How dare you, Prometheus? And so he's punished severely for that. So Chiron, again, plays this almost Christian-like figure, but again, it's inverted. So, you know, when we look at Chiron through the various signs, it takes on um, these qualities that are associated with the sign. And right now, Chiron, and it has been for a while, is in the sign of Aries. And Aries represents the military, war, um, first responders, um, police, uh, athletes, football players, boxers. And, and if you go through and look at what's been happening ever since Chiron went into Aries, I could take you into every one of those categories and unequivocally show you that they've all been affected by Chiron. Let's talk about football, right? What does Aries represent? Represents the head. And what has been one of the biggest hue and cries in pro football over the last 10 years? Concussions. CTE, right? And that became a really big deal. They even made a movie out of it with Will Smith. And so what happens? Well, you have a bunch of mothers who don't want their boys playing football. And one of the things that football does for better or worse is that it does provide a rite of passage for young men. And they have to go through things that are very uncomfortable. They have to confront violence. They have to confront pain. Um, they have to confront at times authoritarian figures that don't give a shit about their feelings, right? They also have to sort of find their place amongst the group, which would be the team. And as a result of this, you have less and less young, young men joining football now because of the hue and cry of these mothers, right? So that's one. Another thing that we've seen through Chiron, thanks to Black Lives Matter and any number of other groups and politicians, is defunding the police, right? And what 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 does that do? It makes the police weaker. You know, whatever whatever your your views are on law enfor on law enforcement, when you take away the resources to hire more people, and you take away the resources to have um, more and in-depth, better training. What you're doing is you are subverting their ability to, at any point in time, do their jobs. And sometimes they, they're crappy at it. Uh, sometimes they're corrupt. But, you know, look at what happened during the summer of Floyd, right? It was a national stand down. And, and we had the hue and cry of defund the police. Aries is the police. Chiron makes it weaker. So that's another example. Look at the armed services. What are they doing with the armed services? 
well, it's okay if you're transgender. It's okay if you're a 250-pound woman. Hey, it's okay if you're a woman and you're a pilot. We'll make a special air flight suit for you to, you know, have you and your baby be able to fly that bomber, right? So that's another version of Chiron. So we're seeing all these versions of Chiron kind of manifest in the culture. Yeah, and I think we've also seen kind of the rise of incel culture with Chiron and Aries, wounded men, men that are wounded and, you know, and just not being able to deal with conventional relationships because, because women have been so empowered to the point where slut culture is, um, you know, celebrated, which is another kind of Chiron and Aries retelling of, second wave feminism, right? So this is all part of what's been going on with Chiron and Aries. And, uh, it, you know, Aries is a fire sign. That's the other part of it. So when we look at um, Bushnell, who set himself ablaze, he's in the military. He's a soldier. And, you know, there's a lot of really interesting kind of threads that that may have contributed to why he did this some people and this is in front of the the um israeli embassy by the way this is where it t- took place some people believe that he was just a soldier of conscience that he was like another version of rachel Corey. other people and i cannot corroborate this but other people believe that he knew that the united states has troops on the ground in Israel. And um, with that and with that knowledge, it made him a candidate for Guantanamo. Um, and so instead of going to Guantanamo, uh, he set himself on fire. I, I, again, I can't corroborate that. But we also have the true node in Aries. And the the nodes are the ascending and descending plane of the moon. So the moon theoretically moves on this slightly graduated plane and it goes up and it goes down. So the graduated up plane is the true node. The graduated down plane is the south node. So we've we've been in the true node in Aries for, when did we start serious sports? Um, that was around... August, I think it was around August of last year, roughly July, August. The the nodes went from um, Taurus, Scorpio to Aries, Libra. And, um, you know, these lunar nodes are also really important for determining, like, what is going on with our time these these uh, nodal cycles last 19 and a half months so if you go back and look at where the moon's nodes were and you as a sports guy will completely appreciate this um when when the uh, the south and they and they move backwards the, the 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 nodes move backwards so the nodes were at i think around 1 one or zero cancer. And this was in uh, 20, 2020. And it was the NFL draft. And if you go back and look, so what is cancer? Cancer is the home. It's family. It's tradition. Um, it's your kind of emotional roots. It's security. It's maternal, right? All those Cancerian things. So they hold the NFL draft. It normally they, they have it in a you know a location like Las Vegas or Nashville or whatever. That year they held the NFL draft at home because of COVID. Right. So you had these shots of these GMs with their kids on their lap, Bill Belichick with his dog making draft picks. That is the true note in cancer, right? Like that that, typif- that typified kind of where we were. 
So then the true node moves into Gemini. And boy, does it move into Gemini, right? It's, uh, it is symbolically represented by uh, the death of George Floyd. So this is right around uh, May, right? Late April, May, I forget the, the exact date. So George Floyd is a Gemini and he died. No, George Floyd is a Libra, my bad. He's a Libra, but he dies again, theoretically in the month of Gemini. I believe it was what, March 24th, or May 24th, May 24th. So he dies in the month of Gemini. He dies in Minneapolis, which is the Twin Cities. And the true node is now in Gemini. What happens? Well, all of a sudden, we have all hell breaking loose. You know, we, 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 we have what is essentially two countries within one. We are a house divided. And to, to even exacerbate that even more, we have a Gemini in the White House and Donald Trump, and he has two emergency proclamations, one which is on uh, March 13th of 2020, and then a month later on April 13th of 2020. In the first one, he basically decouples the states from the union by saying, well, I'm going to let the states handle their response to COVID. We're no longer one nation at that time, which is a very kind of Gemini move, right? We go from the macro to the mic to the to the micro. So we have all these different COVID responses from all over the country. And as a result of that, since we're under that executive order. Trump does not necessarily have the power to do anything at a federal level when the BLM riots hit. So look at that, right? Now now we're dealing with looting and arson and, you know, Gil Scott Heron was wrong when he said the revolution would not be televised. He was wrong because it was televised and it was in our face. And that was the Gemini effect, right? We were, we were, and you know, the, the toppling of statues. I mean, all these things are going on. So what was the opposite sign of Gemini? It's Sagittarius. And what does Sagittarius represent? It represents law, law, tradition. Where was the law? There was no law, you know? And then there's that incredibly weird moment. Sagittarius also represents religion, by the way. And then there's that incredibly weird moment when the church outside the White House is burning down and Trump is there with the Bible and the Bible's upside down. I mean, you couldn't get more nodal in that moment, right? The burning of the church is Sagittarius, right? And canonical law, religious law. And then there's Trump, the Gemini fire starter in a lot of ways. I mean, these nodes are really powerful. Like, we can track where we are with these nodes. And, you know, we came through this nodal period with the true node in Taurus and then the south node in Scorpio. And that that that's after the Gemini Sagittarius opposition. Like, even when people were protesting against, like, the lockdowns after they started to get really tired, they were protesting in their cars. And they were driving around state capitals and honking their horns. Like, that's really Gemini, right? Like, you're driving around in your car, and that's movement. It's Mercury. So there are all these markers that we could look for. What was interesting was a lot of the South Node stuff that was coming up when those nodes shifted Taurus into Scorpio. And we saw a lot of heavy-duty, um, like, Scorpio depravity just surfacing during during that time um so yeah man i mean these nodes are really powerful now and we've had the true node in aries i think since what i think might have been august and so we're dealing with this idea of the true node in aries with um 
the individual and action. And Aries is a sign that tends to be spontaneous, meaning that it doesn't like there's thinking that goes on, but the thinking is very quick and it is a byproduct of the exercise of will. So, um, you know, what we've been dealing with, with this true note in Aries is a, a lot of people getting very angry and, uh, in separating themselves out, right. From, and you can, you can even see this like in social media with the South node and Libra, you know, politeness is out the door, right? People are just doing everything they can to get their point across and, you know, like, fuck you, right? This is all very Aries-like. And I don't think it's necessarily bad. There are good things about the true note in Aries because what you're supposed to be doing during this time is learning how to be more independent, you know, standing apart from institutions. Um, and it's, it's really interesting how we as a society here in this country, I can't speak for other countries per se, but we have made these um, kind of covert compromises, right? A covert compromise. Well, okay, well, this is okay for now as long as I get my football on Sunday, right? Or this is okay for now um, as long as you know my grocery bill isn't in uh, you know three digits or whatever. You know, um, this is okay as long as I get the, right. So we we we've been cultivated into this culture of compromise. And it's it's a really dangerous deal to make these compromises. And now what's happening is that there is less compromise on the table, right? People, you can even see it with some of the you know the shenanigans that are happening on the House with Johnson. Like that's what got Kevin McCarthy kicked out, right? That he was too compromising. Like that's a South Node and Libra moment. And then what do you have? You have people say, well, we don't want anybody that will compromise. You know, we we want single item bills. And a single item bill is very Aries. Like we want one thing. We don't want a bunch of pork buried in the bill. And, and McCarthy was quite good at that, as well as many others. And again, it's a byproduct of Aries, right? It's like, no, we don't want to compromise anymore. You know, we want to have one thing. We want to deal with one thing. The other thing that really strikes me as, again, one of these astrological markers is the carnivore diet. And the carnivore diet is the hunter-gatherer diet, right? And Aries is, is a hunter. And if you're on a carnivore diet, or really on a carnivore diet, you're eating one thing, right? You're eating beef, and that's it. Right. So you can see how these nodes really have their cultural fingerprints on things. So now we throw that true node in there, conjunct Chiron, and they were exact. They were sitting right on top of each other at 17 degrees. And we have the self-immolating, the wounded soldier, one-pointed, single-pointed, you know, there wasn't any compromise there. Well, I'll only set my hand on fire. So, you know, so I, and it'll be my shooting hand. So I'll never have to pull a trigger again. No, he, he went, you know, he went full, full Monty on the blaze. The other thing that I, that I found very weird about that moment was that um, it kind of mirrored in some ways the cover of wish you were here by pink Floyd. And there are those two guys on the cover of the album and one guy's on fire and the other guy's shaking his hand. And you know, who's the main man of pink Floyd is Roger Waters. And what is Roger Waters known for his outspoken attitude towards Israel. 
so this is all to me this 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 stuff gets really deep and fascinating so when i when i saw that it was like oh wow this is a symbol this is a really really big symbol for us you also mentioned the uh, the south node in scorpio and the impact it's having the loss of sanity for lack of a better term this uh, giving in to one's base primal impulses is being uh, pushed as if it's the norm now. Now, granted, a lot of that is breaking out all over the place, but you can hardly spend any time on Facebook or Twitter or other social media and, without seeing some of these videos of Karens having meltdowns, of, of, of teens having meltdowns, of, of road rage. It, it seems like whatever astronomical and non-corporeal forces are working through people, it's having a, an impact and it's causing them people to behave erratically and it's uh, causing them to uh, really give into their base primordial impulses. What are your thoughts about that going forward? Yeah. So, you know, rewind the clock and clearly a lot of that stuff was, you know, coming out during that time. And, um, you know, in Taurus, which is on the other side, is supposed to be grounded and safe and secure. And, um, you know, those, those are the values, theoretically, that we're supposed to champion. Um, and, and I think you bring up an, an interesting question. And it's how these things get inside of us, right? Like, how do they get inside of us? You know, are they, are they a byproduct of these um, cosmic influences that, you know, I mean, we can clearly establish that the moon is a player in our lives, right? Like we could clearly establish through tides and tidal cycles, that the, the moon is really important. The farmer's almanac prints yearly almanacs, how and when to plant by lunar cycles. My girlfriend is a dentist and she will attest that when the full moon um, is on, that there is more blood seemingly available when she goes into people's mouths, right? So we know that the moon has an impact just does physical impact. Um, so how does it get inside of us? Is it through that South node, you know, cause the moon is also co connected to the collective, right? It rules our unconscious forces. You know, when we think of um, somebody like um, Edward Bernays, right. Who was really adept at controlling the masses he often used the egg as a symbol and the egg is a symbol of fertility. And when we think of the moon, we think of the moon as fertility as well, right? Women are on a cycle, right? They're on a cycle that in a lot of ways is, you know, a very feminine lunar cycle. So the, I think the moon plays a tremendous role in this idea that, you know, these, um, I don't know what you, non-corporeal forces can enter into us. And then when we have such a connected relationship with the collective, right, it is easy for people to um, have more of a group madness, even it, whether it's... Um, whether it's, you know, kind of planned and on schedule or whether it's just kind of this unusual byproduct of hysteria. You know, when I, you know, when I think of the moon, I think of hysteria. You know, when we look at the sun, the sun is Apollonian. And you know, when the sun is out, I mean, theoretically, you know, we don't really deal with hysteria that much. Right. We can see where we're going, 
you know, we have shadows, which, you know, sort of define the difference between light and dark. But it's when the sun goes down, you know, that's when people's fears creep up. That's when mania begins. That's when kind of this uh, lunacy can kick in for people. You know, people talk about sleepless nights. They don't talk about sleepless days. So the moon plays a tremendous role in all of this. You know, the, the, ma the maddening of the crowd. So when we look at the lunar phases of the South Node, I think that that's where they get in, right? That's where we're vulnerable. That is the equivalent of a, comp a computer system or network being hacked. Right. It's the South Node that that hacks us or has the potential to hack us. And since we're interconnected with social media in such a way, you know, it's really easy for these algorithms to be pushed. And again, that's control over the collective. And what are they controlling? They're controlling emotions. And the moon is connected to emotions. The sun is not connected to emotions. The sun is dispassionate. Right. The sun is stoic, you know, but not the moon. So I think you're 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 on to something, James, when it when it comes to the how and the why, you know, it's through these lunar forces that are being amplified through social media, which creates mania, you know, and how many times have we gone through these these stupid ass fads? Right, like you know the the you know the the, the Tide Pod, right? Ice this is bucket dumb. challenge. Ice bucket challenge. Right? These are these are all completely, in many ways, irrational. They're 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 kind of lunar, right? And when you look into any real serious astrological deep dives on the moon, they'll take you right where I'm going with it and you know if you look at the the moon card in the uh uh right or weight deck or or most decks it's a fairly ominous card right it doesn't portray the moon in sort of this uh you know sylvan light in sort of this you know um kind of goddess-like figure you know you've got you've got uh Coyote's Bane at the moon. And, you know, it's a fairly ominous card in that deck. And, and it really represents the unknown, but more importantly, the fear of the unknown. And I think that's what's being capitalized on. And, and uh, people have been so traumatized um, that it's easy. It's easy to get in and start turning the screws on people. We've seen in the recent past, uh, people with a little more depth of understanding don't have the primal fear reaction, but for many surface level truthers, as I call them, when there's an announcement or some kind of revelation of, of an impending emergency services alert, uh, FEMA drill, uh, suggestions of uh, hire, mass hiring of crisis actors for a given date or a given series of drills, Suddenly, there's this mass panic that takes hold, right? We saw this in the recent past uh, about this uh, emergency uh, alert, which turned out to be a huge nothing burger, yet people were turning off their phones or putting their phones in their microwaves uh, just to avoid being accessed or something. Uh, and, and there's potential for all of that sometime down the line. But, it, but it's interesting how just a simple... As far as I know, the, the genesis of all that was one podcaster coming on talking about this, and, and it spread like wildfire. And then I think about how the algorithms push, like you just mentioned, these primordial atavistic fears onto us. Like, of course, now Facebook is 90% ads and what have you, but, but the algorithm mixes in like a large amount of editory type videos, short videos, insect wars, uh, monitor lizards devouring goats and, um, and, and other uh, creatures and road rage and uh, you know random acts of violence. 
So what it seems to be doing is at some deep level, it's actually encouraging that sort of behavior, making it more acceptable for one to give in to their base primal impulses where before there may have been some semblance of impulse control, but gradually, incrementally, and now by leaps and bounds, those safety nets have been gradually eroded and, and eradicated yeah. in many people. And now the slightest thing is setting people off. We're seeing videos of mass looting of stores. Uh, if it feels good, do it. And and so that does not portend well, especially for America, when you see the, the mass influx of immigration, uh, of war age fighting males into the country at a time when the the psyche of the very country and country itself is radically divided. You're right. I haven't seen one hasn't seen this level of division since the American Civil War. Uh, what are your thoughts and time you have left in, the, in this first segment of and we can delve into this deeper in, in the member segment about the potential for uh, civil war strife, uh, the country breaking up into like fiefdoms. So I, I think I think I want I want to save the bulk of that for um, the next section because that's a, that's a pretty deep dive um, that that we, there's a lot of areas we can touch on, but I do want to address your question uh, about the videos and the algorithm, and I call this the world star hip hop effect, and there was a, I guess a. a where was world star showing up on it was it wasn't on youtube it was on one of these other um video platform delivery services so people who aren't aware of world star hip hop uh they kind of kind of got their start with something called the knockout game and uh, these would be uh young black males who would um sneak up on somebody and hit them and knock them out and in most cases, the person who was being knocked out was white, right? So the knockout game started to get a lot of traction. And if you go back and look at, again, these are all videos that have been massively pushed on Twitter. Um, there are uh, just numbers of examples of hardcore black on white violence and um it's usually group related two to three uh usually males but not not always males and these videos were populating my feed and all these other feeds right and what does that do you know what what does that do to the to the people who would perpetrate in many, many cases, these senseless acts of violence. Well, it means they're going to get their little 15 minutes. Right. And, and, and so for them, the, the, you know, the endorphin rushes, you know, yo, my video surfaced on Twitter and it's up to four and a half million views. Right. That's a really bad, reward system what does it do to uh the so-called whites who are watching that video it makes their blood boil and it it and it makes them seek retribution right so by doing this they're encouraging one group to continue to do it because well, it's getting traction. And then they are rubbing it in the other group's face. And let's be just, you know, have a moment of honesty here. Okay. Um, ever since the summer of Floyd and the, and the defunding of police and the quote of a de-escalation of interactions, Many of these people who commit these heinous crimes are back on the streets very quickly. There are even cases where somebody has defended themselves, and rightfully so. 
and uh, what comes to mind was the uh, the bodega owner in New York City, and the, the apparently, uh, you know, a girl came in and didn't have enough money for whatever, and he said, "I can't sell it to you," and she was just going to take it. He wasn't going to let her. An adventure boyfriend came in and started tossing with him. This is an older guy who has a bodega in New York. And um, at that point, you know, he, he was in danger of his life. So what did he do? He cut him, got a knife and he cut him. And, you know, what happened? He got arrested. You know, he, here's another example. Now I think eventually they let him walk. I think eventually then you had um, the guy in the subway in New York city and you had the dude that was acting out. Right. And he, he was just trying to subdue this guy. Well, it turns into another George Floyd situation. Now that guy's, now that guy's going to jail. Right. And it's because people have seen all of these things on social media. And again, now let's go back to the true note in Aries. They want to take a stand, right? They want to take a stand. They want to say enough is enough. Frankly, given the situation that we're in, I don't blame them. You know, and again, this is all byproduct of a lot of these soft compromises we made along the way. So then what happens? Well, Let's go into the opposite sign of Libra, right? What is Libra? Fairness, balance, and justice. Well, what do we find out? Well, the law doesn't work the same way for two groups of people. The scales of justice are tilted much more heavily in one direction than the other. All this is by design. This is all social engineering. And the end result is to, to do their absolute very best to create a civil war, to create a race war. And they're, they're, and we could talk about that, you know, again on, on the other side, but that's, and they've been, they've been front loading this for a while now. And I have to say um, that the uh, so-called black community uh, is really waking up and there are, there are a number of podcasters uh even though I don't always agree with him Jason Whitlock is right out front and he's you know telling people especially black males you're being manipulated you're being manipulated by people you're being you're being manipulated by by the democrats and and the liberals you're being manipulated by black women who have been put in a place of power and uh, you're being manipulated by them. You're being manipulated by, uh, you know, socially liberal progressive white women as well. And so these guys are starting to wake up now and, you know, Whitlock starts, you know, he's, he, he gets his crosshairs on some of these sacred cows, like he's taken on Deion Sanders. And now he's taken on Stephen A. Smith. And he's a bulldog, right? He's a Taurus. He's a total bulldog. And there are, you know, there, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of his, his black audience. Well, well, lighten up. Why don't you lighten up? Well, he's not lightening up because nobody else is doing it. You know, he's talking about, in a lot of ways, how these people are being placed in a position of being influencers. And that's that's their role, right? And they're not there to have a discussion about the truth. They're there to push vaccines. Or they're there to, uh, you know, push whatever narrative that the whoever is in power wants them to push. And in this case, you get somebody like Charles Barkley, 
and Charles Barkley and Stephen A. Smith just had a, a podcast together. And, you know, Barkley is uh, vehemently pro-gay and pro-trans, right? And, you know, and, and Stephen A. Smith comes right in. And look, you can be pro-gay, you can be pro-trans, whatever, right? But Jason Whitlock brought up a really interesting point when he was doing a critique. And he says, well, yeah, they're standing up for these people and they're standing up for this perspective. But where are they with the biblical perspective, right? Where are they with the Christian perspective? They're not there. And the reason they're not there is because Charles Barkley's contract with TNT would end real fast if he went down that path, right? So it's really fascinating watching this sort of tidal shift occur. And you're, you're seeing this um, in, in what I would call sort of the black truth community. It's waking up, starting to see more women wake up as well. And we really need this, right? Like they have done everything in their power to pit us against one another. And, and uh, if we're going to survive and get through this, we need basically everybody on the same team, you know? And it's like, there may be differences, but we'll sort those differences out later. And then to your point, there are lots of gatekeepers on the so-called truth movement. And these are real Pied Pipers and they're dangerous people, very dangerous people. And they give you enough information but they don't, they don't give you the whole thing. They just give you enough to feel like you're getting, like Alex Jones is a perfect example of that. He's the king of the gatekeepers. And, um, and, the, and you know, they're dangerous, right? They're dangerous because they give people a limited view of kind of what we're going through. And, you know, if we want to talk about that on the other side, we can do that as well. Well, please cooperate with me, uh, Mr. Pointer, so I can unclick my mute. Uh, thank you. That was a very thoughtful first segment, and uh, we got a lot to uh, mull over in the second segment. Uh, could you give our uh, viewing and listening audience uh, you know, the means to contact you and find all your inform information? Yeah, so I have a website, robertphoenix.com, and my stock and trade is that I am a working astrologer. So I actually work with people um, with their charts and um, in a number of different capacities. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel called the 11th house where I do a lot of uh, stream. Oh, it's all live streaming. So Tuesday through Thursday, I do something called the astro weather. Uh, it starts at eight o'clock in the morning. And I basically look at what's happening astrologically for that day. And I talk about, individual effects, um, collective effects. And I have a star of the day and I try to pick a person whose birthday it is that day that kind of has a unique chart and we can kind of see them in their chart. Uh, on Fridays, I have the Friday forecast, which has been mostly an interview show. Although I've been flying solo a lot lately on that show. Sunday night, I have Sunday night Astro Live where I really dive into astrology. And then, I, and then I've been doing a sports show with um, Al Dog. And that's called serious sports. And we usually do that on Monday night. So just go to the 11th house on YouTube and you'll find a lot of that content. Uh, be sure to click under the live link because that's where the majority of my videos live. Thank you for that, Robert. And for your listeners out there, if you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to the cosmic switchboard.com, sign up, become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the member segment.